as with last week, uh, we will be primarily in Proverbs chapter 4 this morning. Um, If you turn there now, I probably will ask you to go somewhere else first, so we'll see what happens, but it might be a good move to go to Proverbs 4. Let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time to hear your word proclaimed. I'm going to do pray that we would give attention to what is what is here in the text, and, and that you would uh, incline our ear to hear the truth, and that we'd respond rightly to the truth. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Proverbs chapter 4, we began that last week, and I left, I found myself burdened by all that I did not say last week, and um, there's just so much there in Proverbs 4. A few weeks back, I was kind of thinking I would walk through the whole chapter, so very thankful that that didn't have to happen last week. Uh, there was a lot there. There continues to be a lot that we could draw out from Proverbs chapter 4, but the intent this morning will be to, to finish uh, look, looking at a lot of uh, verses 10 through 27 of Proverbs chapter 4. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity for, for part two here to think more carefully about an important subject, to think of wisdom in parenting and uh, in a narrow focus here, but then as we step back at more of a, a general and broad reality too of just godly wisdom and all of our need for godly wisdom. Uh, and that will be, I believe, what, what we'll see as we observe uh, certain truths from this chapter. Last week, some of what was discussed was, was really just acknowledging this reality that um, by seeing Solomon instructing his sons, training his sons, we acknowledge that this is something parents, all parents, are called to do. This is a parent's responsibility to train their children in wisdom. Uh, that's not the only responsibility that's on display in Proverbs 4. Who else is responsible? Well, the child is responsible to listen to their father's instruction, their parents' instruction. Listen carefully, listen well, give attention. And additionally, we observe not only those responsibilities, but we also observe that wisdom is important, wisdom matters, um, and it's available. So we ought to acquire it. But that acquiring of wisdom is not something that just kind of floats to us. It's, it's acquiring wisdom is difficult work. Uh, it's difficult to acquire wisdom. We saw that we had to pay attention in order to, to gather wisdom. We saw that we needed to remember Father's instruction in order to receive wisdom. We also saw that there had to be a love for wisdom. So really, godly wisdom only comes to those who are in a right relationship with the Lord. So acquiring wisdom, boy, wisdom's available for all of us, but it's, it's difficult to acquire. So we need to pay attention. We need to remember. We need to be saved, and God alone does that work of salvation. So it's, it's difficult to acquire wisdom, but it's also beneficial to acquire wisdom. And so as we move through that first address from Solomon, uh, if you're looking down at the page, you'll even see maybe verses 6 through Nine, there was just a variety of statements that were made that remind us of the value of wisdom, the benefits of wisdom, that if you love her, she will guard you. If you prize her, that personified wisdom, that's what we're talking about as this pronoun here, love her, prize her, she will exalt you. And if you embrace her, she will honor you. So wisdom is valuable. It's beneficial. Um, We need wisdom. And so this week we'll move into the other two addresses. If you remember that Proverbs 4 provides for us three different letters, addresses, short addresses that Solomon gives to his sons. And they're pretty easy to kind of find in the outline of the text. Those first nine verses begin with, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. So that's the first address. Verse 10 begins the second address. Hear my son and accept my words. So it starts very similar to the first. And the third address will begin in verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. So we'll look starting in verse 10 at that second address and, 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 and hope to spend some time there and in the third address as well. So we need wisdom. Solomon's sons needed wisdom. Solomon needed wisdom. Uh, that's, that's not a, a shock to any of us. 
But Solomon's sons needed to be instructed in wisdom, and that is a truth that remains true for all of us today, as certainly our children as well, that our children need wisdom. Our children need to be instructed in wisdom. And so how, what I want to do at the very beginning is just really kind of point out a few realities uh, of why we all need wisdom, why we all need to be instructed in wisdom. We just start with the first point would be, and this comes from Proverbs, in fact, our children need wisdom because the world in which they live was created in wisdom. Go back to t- chapter 2 real quick in Proverbs. Wisdom comes from God. So we live in God's world. In Proverbs 2, 6 and 7 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Go to the next chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. It says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. So wisdom comes from God. Chapter 2, verse chapter 3 reminds us that everything that God has created, he created in wisdom. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. And a very similar, more maybe poetic example of this is found in chapter 8. You don't have to turn there right now, but in chapter 8, there's this uh, reality of wisdom being present with God throughout all of creation. So the presence of wisdom in God's creation is what you read about through so much of uh, Proverbs chapter 8. And so, last week I suggested that to, to walk in a wise way, to be wise would be to walk in skill. And if we are going to live skillfully in this world, the world that the one true God created, that he created it in perfect wisdom, we're going to have to have wisdom. We're go- you're going to have to live by wisdom to live in God's world that he created in wisdom. Here's a great quote from a commentator, Dwayne Garrett. He says this, If the universe is made in accordance with the principle of wisdom, it is folly to anyone to live contrary to those principles. So to bristle with anything that God says is folly. To, to walk in rebellion against any of God's good designs is foolishness. Those are our only two options, in fact, uh, to live in this world is either to walk in a wise way or to walk foolishly. Wisdom and folly, those are the two ways to live. And we'll see that on display certainly in this second address from Solomon. But there's certainly a lot of folly on display all around us reminding us of why we need to be instructed in wisdom. So many try to live in rebellion against God's wise designs, and that is anything but wise. So we need to be instructed in wisdom because the world in which we live was created in wisdom. And we also, our children also, need to be instructed in wisdom because of the nature of man. And let's just stick with the wisdom literature here to, to kind of look at a, a theology of children, really a, a, an anthropology, a, a theology of man, to see our, our nature. So we'll start. Um, I bet you might want to, if you want to take notes, that's fine, but I bet you're not going to want to turn to all of these because I'll probably move faster than, than that um, would work out very well for all of us. So Psalm 51, verse 5 tells us something very important about the nature of man, the theology of children. Psalm 51, verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So Psalm 51 teaches us something very important about mankind. We are born sinners. We sin because we're sinners, as has been said up here before. Uh, We were brought forth in iniquity. So when we think of our sinful nature, that that's what, our, we're conceived in sin, we come into the world as sinners, so we need uh, instruction in wisdom because we are born sinners. Psalm 58 verse 3 says something very similar. The wicked are estranged from the womb. 
they go astray from birth, speaking lies. So that's interesting because we're realizing that it's not primarily uh, our surroundings that, that, that explain why someone might pursue wickedness. It's our nature. It's, be, it's because of us. It's not because of our surroundings. It's because of us that, that we find ourselves doing wicked things. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth. So we're born in sin. We're wicked from birth. We need wisdom. Well, there's hope in light of this from Proverbs as well. Proverbs 29, 15. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. So if you think of someone from a Psalm 58 type of sense of, of wicked from birth, uh, wicked from the get-go, and then you read in Proverbs that the rod and reproof give wisdom to those who are born in wickedness. The rod and reproof, uh, if you don't leave a child to their wickedness, but use God's tool belt for parents of the rod and reproof. A child left to himself, meaning a child that did not receive instruction, a child that has not received the rod, uh, generally speaking here, is a shame to his mother. A child left to himself brings shame to his mother. So Proverbs 29, 15, in a very succinct and, and powerful, um, concise way, says, parents, you got to instruct your kids. Parents, you got to discipline your kids. That's language that we hear in the New Testament as well from Paul in Ephesians 6. That's the parent's responsibility. Instruction and discipline. So we instruct our children in obedience. When they don't obey, we discipline them for their disobedience. And so don't spare the rod. Don't spare instruction either. We, we, we need both in the home because who you're dealing with. Proverbs chapter 22, 15. We just looked at 29, 15, but 22, 15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And here's the second half. So then say like, so good luck, or sorry about that. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So we're, we're drawn to the benefits of discipline, uh, to even think of, of God's wise design in parenting, to, to discipline uh, the consequences for sin, sowing and reaping. You, you disobey, and you'll be disciplined for it. Obedience matters, and, and, and folly is bound up in the heart of a child. It's what we do well. We're, we're experts in sin, and we're, um, folly is bound up in us, and it needs to be removed from us. And the means by which that takes place uh, in God's wise design is for the parents to instruct and discipline their children. Folly is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. That's, that's just a helpful, encouraging reminder, taking note of both the condition of man and, and God's means for parenting. Proverbs 22.6 We've talked about this verse before as well, but it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. And you might remember, I, I still find myself convinced of more of a minority view on, on what Proverbs 22.6 actually should be translated as. I don't think this is like a, a, a in, I think this is more a threat. It's certainly not a promise. And I think it's more of a threat than kind of just like a, a, a good news uh, quote here. I think it's not saying train him up in the, um, according to, his, uh, you know, like the way he should go. I think it's saying leave a child in, in the way that, it, according to his own way, let a child do what he wants, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. So I think this is really kind of a threat, a sarcastic threat that Solomon's telling parents. Listen, you let your child do whatever they want, they're not going to leave that when they're older. Uh, even when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. So we're seeing that training needs to take place in the heart of our children where folly is bound up in them. Training is needed, instruction is needed, because our children, left to their own way, will pursue what they know best, what they're bound up with, foolishness. So train your children. Our children need to be instructed in wisdom. Proverbs 19, 18 says that there's good reason for this. There's hope in the midst of this. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. So if you think of the way we started here saying, children, uh, all mankind, Psalm 51, Psalm 58, are born in sin. And you might think, well, then there's just no hope. 
But, but no, there's always hope with the gospel, and, and the gospel is often what is, ought to be what is, is on the lips of a parent in their instruction. And so our discipline and instruction is to be gospel-filled, and our discipline even ought to be what is used often to draw the hearts of our children to their need for Christ. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. So there's a lot of verses uh, about the importance of training, but I think all of those build up to the next verse that is probably well known for, for many of us. It's in, in Psalm 127. If you think about what we've said so far, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. From the womb, wickedness prevails. All these different statements that we've read. And then you go to Psalm 127, which is as true as all of these other verses. This is God's word we're talking about. And these individuals that are bound up with folly, who are wicked from birth, who are conceived in sin, what does David say um, about children? Behold, children are a blessing from the Lord. The children are a heritage from the Lord. Well, how can that be true? I mean, I, we know it, we've experienced it, but how is it that someone bound up with folly, someone who is born in wickedness, uh, inclined towards wickedness, is a blessing? They're like arrows in the hand of a warrior, says the psalmist, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. So children are a blessing, and the more you have, the more blessing you have of these children. How can this be? How can Proverbs 10 be that a wise son makes a glad father? Well, the adjective there matters. A wise son makes a glad father. Children are a blessing because parenting is a blessing because God has blessed the family with parents and children. And so our parents instruct and discipline our children in the ways of the Lord. And God often uses that to draw the hearts of the children to Christ, to turn to Christ, to repent of their sin, uh, to be regenerated, to be born again, Uh, and and their blessings to their families, and their blessings to society. Children are a blessing, and and we take great comfort in Psalm 127, because uh, if we discipline our sons, not a promise here, Proverbs 29, 17, this is just a general truth, as all the Proverbs are. Proverbs 29, 17 says, discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. So, long point here, but our children need instruction in wisdom because of their nature, because of the sinfulness of man, and because of the commands of God. Um, Our children need instruction in wisdom because they're born in sin. And what a blessing it is then to, to, for those who are parents, to to parent their children. Um, It's no surprise then that the family is a place where Satan is actively engaged in assaulting the family because of God's good design. The family is a transmitter, a crucial transmitter of wisdom. That's Mark Dever's words. Uh, The family's a a place where truth is proclaimed. And so the family's crucial. Children are at a crucial time in their lives of acquiring wisdom. And so you better believe that Satan is on the prowl, seeking to devour all that he can of our children, So this divine institution, the family, is under Satan's attack. And um, I just found out even over this past week, uh, actually, Rod was drawing my attention to a sermon series that had taken place this past month out at Grace Community Church where Pastor John MacArthur was preaching. Uh, The series is titled Shade for Your Children. He actually preached a series years back with that same title, but this is something that's current from just this past month, and he spent the first sermon really expressing this reality of why our children need wisdom in the midst of not only their own sin, but the, the sin of, of their surroundings and, and Satan's attack on them as well. Let me give you a quote from the beginning of this sermon series. MacArthur says, war in and on the family is pervasive and unmistakable. Family life is hard enough due to human sinfulness and due to the presence of the kingdom of darkness and the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. It's made even harder because of the collective culture amassing with great force its wickedness and driving it right at marriage and the family. 
all the forces of sin, internally and externally, are driven at destroying the family. And obviously, that destructive effort is most devastating to our children. So he says, that destructive effort is most devastating to our children. And if you're paying attention, it's not hard to see that destructive effort on display all around us. When you think of uh, those who advocate for normalizing that which is abnormal, by rejecting God's good design and creating man and woman, male and female, and you better believe that our children are being indoctrinated with these deceptions by trying to normalize that which is abnormal, that which is an offense against God. And redefining what God has already defined in marriage. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And our culture is headed towards a place where if you are to disagree with that, uh, you're going to be labeled uh, a bigot. Uh, you're going to be punished for speaking against um, any false understanding of marriage, anything other than God's good design for one man and one woman. So anyway, our children need to be instructed in wisdom. It's of the utmost importance due to their own condition, but also due to the assault that that Satan pours out on our families. And I believe that's what you're going to see as you jump into Proverbs chapter 4, 10, and following, because this second address, Solomon is really saying, hey, listen, listen to my voice, hear me, pay attention. My voice is not going to be the only voice calling out, though. Uh, the, the world is going to cry out as well. Folly is calling for your attention, and you would do well to ignore that verse. Uh, that you do well to ignore that voice. Uh, did I say that wrong again? You would do well to not listen to that voice. You can do well to like ignore what I just said too for a few minutes. My goodness. All right, so in 10 through 19, Ben read this earlier, and so I'm just going to kind of summarize several things without reading through the verse in entirety. We'll just walk our way through it, but uh, path number one on display in verses 10 through 19, path number one is the way of wisdom. You see that in verse 11. Solomon's calling his son to accept his words, his blessings from accepting his words, long life, years of life, so that your life may be many, he says. But in verse 11, he's saying, walk down the path of wisdom, the way of wisdom. It's also known as the paths of uprightness, that's what Solomon says. Walk the way of wisdom, the fruit of such a walk, the fruit of that path, well, steps that are not hampered. When you're running, you will not stumble meaning walking the road that God has called for you is one that will lead to blessings. Um, Walking in God's ways is right. It's good for you. So walk the path of wisdom. Your steps won't be hampered. He's not going to lead you down the wrong way, lead you into harm. He's He's going to lead you where you ought to be. So in light of this, the way of wisdom that leads to these blessings ought to be something that you keep hold of. Do not let go. Guard her. That is the language that you're seeing in verse 13. My son, walk in wisdom. Uh, There are blessings to walking in wisdom. So in light of these truths, embrace wisdom and then keep hold of wisdom. Verse 13, keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Well, let's look at option B. Again, there are, there's no middle ground. We have the way of wisdom, which we just saw. It's the paths of uprightness. You won't stumble, so keep it, guard it, embrace it. The other option, option two, is the way of wickedness. You see it in verse 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked. So the path of the wicked is also known as the way of the evil. What's the fruit of this path? Exactly opposite of what we just saw about the way of wisdom. Those who go down this path, they stumble. They they find themselves reaping the consequences of their folly, of their wickedness. They stumble. Their diet is wickedness and violence. That That is not a menu that you want to have as your only options. Wickedness and violence is what you will eat. 
So the response in light of this path of wicked, it ought to be one of, well, just, just you know, be careful. No, 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 no. Avoid it. Stay away from it. Do not go on it. Turn away. Pass on. Ignore the path of the wicked. So walking in wisdom then, it requires both acquiring, positively embracing, keeping wisdom, but it also involves actively rejecting wickedness. Don't go down the path. Avoid it. Pass on. Embrace wisdom. Reject folly. And so without taking away from the weightiness of what Solomon is saying in this section, I think it's helpful to kind of view the argument that he's using here similar to, to what often comes up in maybe some of our children's conversations, but in our family's home, maybe you as well. Do you ever have conversations about would you rather? And you ask somebody a question, would you rather do this or this? You know, just this morning I was talking to a few of my boys and one of the questions that was asked, just that we're looking for some fun would you rathers. And it was, would you rather have, you know, a chance to win $20 or would you rather just have ten dollars. So like a would you rather, you're kind of thinking, well, there's some pros and cons to both options, so I need to think carefully about what would I rather have. And a lot of times would you rather involves like a shark and an alligator, you know, like you're trying to think what's worse. Not as much like what's best, but, but sometimes it's what's best. Would you rather this than that? And I think that Solomon really is arguing with a would you rather mentality to his children at this point. You know, in our flesh, we've seen our nature. We're inclined towards foolishness. And so we're inclined to even want to answer the would you rather informed by our flesh. So at first glance, some of the options in Proverbs are difficult to answer right away because we think, well, actually one sounds pretty good and the other, wait, which one is good? So we have to think carefully. We have to think with wisdom because would you rather receive correction, or have your own way? <laughs> well, think how you're gonna, wanting to answer that and then thinking that's not right. Uh, the Bible is clear that, that we need to receive correction. That is God's wisdom for us, that, that in variety of settings, that we receive correction. We see where having your own way leads. And so as, as Solomon paints this picture of wisdom and folly, often saying which, which, the, way of the, wisdom, the way of the wise is to receive correction. The way of the, the fool has his own way. You know, that, that was me just paraphrasing the, the message of Proverbs. But another one, another would you rather. Would you rather acquire wealth or acquire wisdom? And so in my mind, I might be tempted to think more temporally of, oh man, it would be nice to have a lot of wealth. But then we think, step back, no, no, no. What's the most valuable thing that we could ever have is a right relationship with the Lord and to walk according to his ways and to find assurance in being right with the Lord and to please him all our days. We need wisdom. It's the most valuable thing we could ever acquire. So the answer to would you rather acquire wealth or wisdom ought to be right off the top of your tongue. Wisdom. I want to acquire wisdom. Or would you rather work hard or lay around all day? And you think, ah... Uh, where does one lead? You know, in my flesh, I want to think, I want to just be handed everything. You know, we need to work hard. And so, in Proverbs 2, I'm sorry, Proverbs 4, this second address, Solomon's given us this would you rather in the summary of his statement of two ways to live. Because in our flesh, we love the thought of ease and uh, mindlessness and, and selfish ambition. You know, those are the things that we're in, inclined to. And Solomon is saying, as tempting as this path down Folly's Road, because it doesn't just advertise itself as this horrible option, and, but we need to recognize it for what it is, this deadly, dark, um, utterly dark option for us. Do not go down the way of the wicked, because here's the would you rather in verses 18 and 19. Would you rather run unhindered? I'm sorry, we would need to go back more than um, just 18 and 19, but the, all of, of uh, this second address basically saying, would you rather run unhindered or stumble? Would you rather walk in light or walk in utter darkness? That's how it's summarized at the end. Look at 18 and 19. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, 
which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. So acquire wisdom. Receive instruction. Pursue the way of wisdom because the way of wickedness, the way of folly leads to destruction. It is utter darkness. Just think of John three nineteen through 21. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Those who are in Christ, your best days are yet to come. You know, when you see that light shines brighter and brighter until full day, that's the future that awaits those who walk in wisdom, those who are in Christ. Your best days are yet to come. Our paths shine brighter and brighter. Choose wisely which path you're going to go down because um, the choice should be obvious, but we need God's grace in order to have eyes to see the obvious realities of, of this. Okay, let's move then to this third address found in verses 20 through 27 of chapter 4. And I'll just walk through this one as well. Uh, we've seen this word before, but what a timely and needed word uh, Solomon begins with in verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Solomon's used this word four times in his many chapters. Be attentive. Pay attention. Came up last week in verse 1, but we see that paying attention is important in the life of a Christian. Uh, Paying attention is very much involved in our pursuits of wisdom. We need to be trained in this to pay attention. It's hard to pay attention. Even in, in sitting in the midst of a sermon, you know, and someone's standing and you're sitting, and then it can become easy just to kind of like drift off in your mind and, and think about lunch, think about shopping lists, think about this, that, or the other. And we have to kind of like step back and go, whoa, 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 whoa. pay attention. Right, go back, look, where am, where am I? You know, and follow in the sermon. Any of our intake in God's word, it's hard to pay attention. You find yourself, even maybe you're disciplined enough to sit down and read the Bible, but then you read the Bible and you think, don't know what I just read. I know that I read, I think, but I don't know what I read. And so we've got to go back and pay attention as we take in God's word. And when a father is speaking to his child, giving instruction, the same thing matters here. Pay attention. That's what Solomon is saying here. So we've got to listen up. We have to incline our ear to hear uh, as a father instructs his child. You know when you hear something very interesting, hear something that you really want to know about, you know, you, you kind of sit in with your posture, pay attention, listen up. That's what we have to do with instruction in wisdom. Incline our ear to wisdom's voice. And this is not the only body part that Solomon refers to in this third address. Our ears ought to listen up, but he speaks of our eyes as well our hearts, our lips, and our feet. All of these body parts come up in this section. I think the point here, which is actually made by a commentator, uh, John Kitchen, I thought this was very helpful. Let me read it. The point here with all of these different activities in the pursuit of wisdom is that wisdom requires constant maintenance. So it's not just something that happens once you receive wisdom and then you just move on with no more effort. No, wisdom requires constant maintenance. A heart, here's what John Kitchen says, a heart once instructed in the ways of God's wisdom is not set for life. That's a a somber warning here. A heart once instructed in the ways of God's wisdom is not set for life. Do not let that which you have acquired Depart from your sight. Verse 21, let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. Listen up, pay attention, incline your ear, and then don't lose that which you acquired. What an important truth, and what a tragic reality to think of who is writing in uh, in Proverbs 4. Solomon here, to think of what we know to be true about Solomon. You know, Solomon's the wisest man in the world, and and he's 
passing on this wisdom to his children. And, and turn to 1 Kings real quick. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. Because of last week, I referred to chapter 3 of 1 Kings. Sorry, I'm singing the Old Testament song in my head right now, so I had to stop talking. Okay, found it. All right, 1 Kings 11. Last week, it was 1 Kings 3. And we were saying the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And we saw that Solomon, in his wisdom, asks for wisdom in 1 Kings 3. And in fact, the way that 1 Kings 3 even begins... There, it, it describes Solomon as one, Solomon loved the Lord. That's what 1 Kings 3 says. Solomon loved the world, the, the Lord. <laughs> Later, he'll, he'll love the world. But in, in 1 Kings 3, Solomon loved the Lord. And so his instruction to his son was to not let wisdom escape from his sight, not let wisdom abandon, leave him. Keep it in your heart. And we observe Solomon walking in wisdom. Solomon making even wisdom attractive to those who saw how he led. How he led in wisdom, how he prayed in wisdom. How Solomon even sought to pass the wisdom on to the next generation. There's so much wisdom going on in Solomon's reign. God tells, promises Solomon even, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Um, I told you to turn there, so I have to at least honor your efforts there. Let's read the passage then. 1 Kings 11. I'm sorry for forgetting to read this. 1 Kings 11 says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. You recognize the shift that has taken place from chapter 3 to chapter 11? Chapter 3 begins, Solomon loved the Lord. 1 Kings 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Solomon loved many foreign women. Well, how many women? 1,000 more than he should. And verse 4 says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David, his father, had done. Well, how did we get from chapter 3 to chapter 11? It wasn't overnight. You see in verse 4 of 1 Kings 11, that in Solomon's older age, as he was old, he, he, his love for God was replaced by this love for foreign women who worshipped false gods. That was really a big issue here, too, because it led him to worship false gods as well. This Solomon who loved the Lord became Solomon the idolater. He was an adulterer and an idolater. He loved the Lord, now he loved foreign women. And so, why did he get here? How, we saw how he got here, not overnight. Why did he get here? Well, I think the answer is our text, Proverbs 4, uh, 20 through 27, when we see the advice that he gives his son should have been advice that he kept all his days. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. First Kings 11.4 referred to Solomon's heart three times. It said his wives turned away his heart. His heart was not true, wholly uh, true to the Lord. Uh, his heart was not like his father's heart, is what First Kings 11 says. So Solomon did not guard his heart. So we're not speaking of a physical organ. I don't think we're, we're probably tempted to think that way. When we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the real you, our innermost being, like that control center of 
our lives. To, um, I'll turn to Mark 7. If you're able, turn there as well. Just, just kind of illustrate what the heart functions in the life of the believer. We see the heart is the real you. Listen to Mark 7, 14 through 23. Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Jesus says, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. He said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. You know, we recognize our our heart is wicked and evil apart from Christ. That's what corrupts us, not our surroundings. Our heart that is depraved, that's what corrupts us and that's what determines what we think, say, and do is our corrupt hearts. So, a 17th century Puritan pastor, his name was John Flavel, he wrote an entire book on Proverbs 4.23, and here's how he begins the book in reference to the heart. The heart of man is the worst part before it is regenerated, and the best afterward. So we're, we're presupposing regeneration here when we're saying keep your heart, guard your heart. We're talking about somebody's heart that has been regenerated, someone who is right with the Lord. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard your heart. Only a heart whose affections have been set on Christ is one that ought to be kept. You know, repent of sin, turn to Christ. Once you're right with the Lord, you're in Christ, guard your heart. So Solomon's words here remind us of our aim. This, this is heart work. It's hard work, but it's heart work that we're to be doing as parents, that anyone's to be doing in discipleship, that all of us are to be doing as individuals. We're to guard our hearts, shepherd our hearts. Um, And there's a reason for this effort. Verse 23b of Proverbs chapter 4, when he says, keep your heart with all vigilance, he says, for from it flow the springs of life. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Solomon says, guard your heart, for from it flow the springs of life. We're to vigilantly be on guard for our hearts because that is the real you. That's out of it flows all that we think, say, and do. So guard your hearts. As our time comes to an end, you'll notice in these verses that the instruction continues. We're to guard our hearts. We're to guard our mouths. Verse 24 says, Jesus even reminds us that when he says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We're to guard our mouths. So much wisdom and so much folly is on display through our speech. Guard your speech. Guard your lips. Guard your mouth. We need to guard our speech. Solomon says, so too, guard your eyes. Verse 25. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. In Psalm 101, David said this about guarding his own eyes. He said, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I don't want to move past this practical instruction here just to recognize to walk in a way that pleases the Lord. We have to be vigilant in our lives to to guard what we take in, uh, to guard what we hear, to guard what we see, to guard what we say, and all of it depends on having a heart that is being guarded. So guard your heart, guard your mouth, guard your eyes. Solomon also says guard your feet, verses 26 and 27. Pay attention where you are in your walk. Ponder the path of your feet, verse 26, and then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Stay the course. Walk the straight path, the right path. 
Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Don't be distracted by the competing calls that you're going to hear. Stay focused. Walk the way of wisdom. I think it would be helpful even just to point out a helpful reminder here for us, for me, for those of us who are parenting children here. We are seeing two helpful pieces of instruction here. If what matters most is the heart, and we're recognizing, well, who can change a sinner's heart? Well, the Holy Spirit alone. Parenting is a prayerful ministry. If we're going to aim to shepherd the heart, we have to be praying parents. We have to pray for the souls of our children. But it's not at conflict or contradictory with requiring obedience in the home. So, so it's right to, as a leader, provider, protector in your home, to, to not allow certain things to be said, to guard the speech in our home. It's all right to set standards for what is going to be listened to, what is going to be watched, where we're going to go, because we are to guard our eyes, guard our ears, guard our feet. But all of it is in an attempt in trusting the Lord to, to guard the heart, to shepherd the heart. So we're dependent on God to do this work, but, but we as parents are the means by which we we, we assist our kids to guard these, um, these gates, our eyes, our feet, etc. Well, last, time, last statement I'll make here. Uh, we began our time with a sequence of reasons of why we need wisdom. Let me do one more. Why do we need wisdom? Well, because wisdom is a person. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. We need wisdom. We need Christ. Wisdom comes from God, and it's found in Christ. So the call here, wisdom's call, is to trust in the Lord, to trust in Christ. Trust in Him, and you will have eternal life. Let's consider this as we observe communion. Uh, I'll, I'll close in prayer, and those who are going to assist, if you would come forward as I pray, but let's, let's pray together as we prepare for communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning, the time to gather, to hear from your word, to, to be instructed in the ways of wisdom. May this be the path that we as individuals, that we as a church go down. God, we pray that you'd give parents wisdom in how they lead, how they instruct, how they discipline their children in love, to, to uh, prayerfully seek that their hearts uh, be guarded and shepherded. That, that We pray that our children would grow to love wisdom. We pray that everyone who's listening to this sermon would love wisdom, embrace wisdom, and not forsake wisdom. I've got to pray as we observe communion that you be glorified as we delight in the gospel and all its implications. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.